There's never been a better time to be an anime fan. There's so much content to enjoy and so many diverse shows catering to so many varied tastes. And if you don't enjoy something, no worries. Next season, there's a whole new batch of shows available to get invested into and share your passions with the entire world. Anime has become a global medium. It's being produced by so many entities and has become more widely available today than it's ever been before. Even if a show doesn't become successful in Japan, that's no longer a shackle for it and it means thanks to the global audience more sequels can be produced. This has in large part been thanks to the licensing and distribution methods that have popped up and flourished since the late 2000s. And as an anime fan, I'd personally pinpoint 2012 as the year seasonal anime became big. It went from something that was available in limited quantities, months to years after its broadcast, to simultaneous streaming day and date with Japan within a few hours of the television broadcast. As internet streaming companies like Crunchyroll grew, more and more players began to take notice. So what went from essentially being a duopoly in western markets between Crunchyroll and Funimation began to attract many more high profile players from 2015 onwards. Year after year, the anime industry has recorded record growth and in large part thanks to the streaming companies and more recently the rise of Chinese streaming platforms like Bilibili and Yoku means that anime has become more widely available legally than ever before. This has led to record revenues to the point where the licensing fees alone could pay for the entire cost of production. As such, seeing the potential in this market, mainstream players like Amazon and Netflix quickly joined the fray, with Amazon inking a deal to host every Noitamina, Animeism and Twin Engine show and Netflix more recently going into production deals with animation studios directly, like Studio Bones, Production IG, David Production, and Wiz Studio. To add to that, Netflix has also inked deals with television networks to stream anime. For example, Fuji TV's Plus Ultra Time Slot. These circumstances mean that anime has become more profitable and more prosperous for those stakeholders than ever before. However, you might be wondering how an industry recording record growth and revenues needs to be saved. It doesn't make logical sense. And as you quickly come to find out when talking about anime, nothing makes logical sense. You see, anime is produced through a system called the Production Committee System. It's a system that was devised in the late 80s to 90s with one of the most famous and earliest applications being Akira, which was one of the most expensive anime to produce at that time, and Neon Genesis Evangelion, which spurred on the more widespread adoption for the system. With the introduction of the Production Committee System, it allowed for more shows to be produced with more partners contributing to the costs of making the show for a share of the rights. This system puts power and wealth in the hands of the financiers of anime who can make back royalties on a show and the reality is being on one show in one committee isn't going to return a huge sum of money. So these companies are usually funding the production of many shows in the hopes that some of them become hits and bring in a greater profit and offset any of the shows that fail. Interestingly enough, this means that being on a single committee for a single show may bring in some revenue for a studio if their share is large enough. But the problem is that anime studios are typically in debt and don't make enough to fund their own shows with the exception of a few big studios and a few very smart players. This leads to committee members funding more and more shows in the hopes that some become successful and with the growth and popularity of anime, certainly the prospect of having a successful anime has become more likely, although the crowded space has made it more competitive. With the rapid globalization and distribution of anime, the system has created a bubble being fueled by constant growth and development of new shows to feed the demand for more anime from both external entities like Netflix and Crunchyroll and local entities like the Japanese publishers and the television networks. Now typically in any system what's meant to happen is with an increase in demand and a lack of supply, studios and animators should become more expensive. However the reality is there hasn't been an increase in wages or salaries and in fact the introduction of these major players has done nothing for the increasing of wages of the core workforce. There was even a very popular hashtag in Japan last year where animators showed their payslips for jobs they had done on Netflix shows and said that they had made no more money than they would have on any other show. 
This highlights that whilst companies like Amazon and Netflix are investing into the space of anime, the impact of their investment is that the production committees are absorbing those revenues and the staff associated have to work even more for the same rates to accommodate the increasing demand for anime. So when I say that anime has to be saved, it's not that anime is unpopular or that rampant piracy of the mid 2000s has caused the bubble to burst, it's that the increasing and ever growing demand for anime has led to an overproduction of anime and with the limited amount of animators and staff across the industry, these circumstances are what will lead to the death of anime. It's kind of ironic that rather than a death by low demand, it's the high demand for anime and the greed that withholds the proper compensation for staff who are actually working on shows that in my eyes will lead to the death of anime or even worse the death of staff from overwork. I cannot understate how dangerous this is and within the last month there has been reports that at Studio Madhouse during crunch time a production assistant worked 363 hours in a month and they were made to work all day and all night even on weekends and public holidays. The employee even collapsed due to overwork as a result and had to be taken to the hospital. To put this in perspective, a typical work week is considered to be 40 hours. So aside from the 40 hours a week that is standard, they worked an additional 323 hours of overtime in a month. That's 13 days straight, so nearly half of the month was spent at work. Even worse is when you take those hours and convert them to work weeks and it turns out to be the equivalent of more than 8 working weeks in a month. This is absolutely irresponsible and studios need to take responsibility for their staff and those who are employed under them as well as the freelancers that work on their shows. As for the production assistant, they joined the trade union who's been fighting on their behalf. The head of the union remarked saying that there's no denying that behind this black company lies a black industry. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, a black company is a Japanese term for an exploitative sweatshop type employment system. He later went on to discuss the circumstances that led to his overwork, saying, I was working on one of the later episodes of a series. The storyboards only got done a month before the broadcast, so we had to compact the three month production schedule into one month. During that time, I would sleep at the studio for three days, only going home to have showers. Once the assistant had informed the studio that he had been hospitalized, he was given a day off but went back to work the following day. Yet the animation supervisor was asking for corrections right up until the deadline and the episode met the minimum standard of quality at the expense of everyone else's health and sleep. The worst part is since the work was delivered to standard, the higher ups at Madhouse assumed everything was fine and nothing was addressed. This is the culture that permeates throughout the entire industry. Madhouse isn't some special entity and this isn't something unique to a single studio. No matter the show, no matter the popularity, nothing should come at the expense of workers' lives when they're being treated as nothing more than expendable cogs in a machine that gives them no reward for their work. This story has been huge and this comes as a result of one person who chose to speak up and go to a union. Anime, since its inception, has fought against giving production staff the proper equity it deserves and as a result the continual outsourcing and disenfranchising of workers' rights through the freelance system and the lack of remuneration has devalued and overworked the staff as the continual demand for anime has gone up. Famed animator and Jojo Part 4 anime character designer Nishi Terumi commented on the story and as a vocal critic of the industry in the past, she's highlighted her disappointment in the anime industry. The fact is, most television anime is produced with lower budgets than anything outside Japan. This means that a limited amount of money is being spent on content production and as a result, low wages are being paid to animators. Just recently, Sakuga Blog surveyed 25 production assistants about their working conditions and I highly recommend checking out the full coverage of their work as the responses illustrate the dire situation that are facing members who are vital to the production of anime. Whilst 48% of those production assistants who were surveyed said that they were full-time employees, 44% were contracted with only one person being surveyed saying that they were a freelance employee. For those surveyed, the majority of them were regularly required to do overtime and commit to being always available in case something goes wrong with the production. 
With cases such as the famed A1 production assistant committing suicide due to overwork, it's no surprise that the industry is in need of dire change, yet five years removed from that incident, nothing substantial in the industry has changed and the industry as a whole has grown more complacent and failed to address these issues. Even more surprisingly and in true anime industry fashion, according to Magican production assistant Renato Rivera Rusca, these production assistant roles themselves are being outsourced to dedicated companies who can deliver 24 hour efficiency by dividing the workload into nighttime and daytime production assistants. As per the role, they go around collecting work from anime lists to ensure that the materials are delivered in a timely manner. However, this doesn't solve the core issues facing production assistants. It only just obscures the issues by outsourcing and expecting 24 hour efficiency. Studios need to play an active part in ensuring that workers are responsibly taken care of and that they are remunerated for their work fairly. To put it simply, here's the end game, unless something changes, taking on these shows and overworking your staff will lead to extreme stress, worsening the health and possibly causing death as has happened in the past. It's no secret that animators and production assistants have died from the stress related to the harsh deadlines of the anime industry and until these problems are addressed there will be more deaths. Studios need to increase their rates for shows, compensate their staff appropriately and limit the amount of work they take at any given time to ensure that the workloads aren't negatively impacting their staff. There is no benefit to staff being under constant pressure and they also have to demand more of committees so that they're paid fairly for their work. Whilst for the studios taking on more work might seem like the right answer, the truth is there's less people entering the anime industry right now than there has ever been in the past. And the circumstances surrounding the industry regarding the treatment of workers has meant that there's a limited workforce for this reason. Without a steady stream of new talent, the anime industry will face a reckoning that will lead to its death. Likewise, government intervention is something that needs to be explored. However, in spite of knowing these issues, the Japanese government has done nothing but paid lip service to the creative industries by promoting this cool Japan initiative. The government doesn't fund productions and hasn't contributed to alleviating these systemic issues because maintaining the status quo is easier than introducing laws and alternatives to the current anime production system, which has left employees and production staff vulnerable to exploitation by their corporate stakeholders who have no incentive to change the practices that occur under their productions. Ruska brings a valuable perspective in highlighting how government funding and support in the European and Asian countries has allowed for the fostering of creative industries and the creation of amazing pieces of art that would have been much more difficult to make otherwise. Likewise, the current system favours those who are already established and corporate sponsors currently have been experiencing record growth with the proliferation of anime across the globe. But this generational gap has left many of the younger staff fighting just to survive and live in an economy that expects them to work longer hours for less and even sometimes no pay. Something that I've been coming to terms with is that whilst budgets do not equate to quality of an anime, by and large most anime have tiny budgets, especially when compared to foreign productions. As a result, anime has become a product of limitation. It's always been that way since the Tezuka days and in spite of the continual productivity increases, stakeholders have an old head mentality which holds back the potential for both creativity and greater funding. The current system only works because despite how everyone feels about studio names and creators, to stakeholders the only thing that matters is making a profit in the safest way possible by the end of the production. The production committee system is a way to mitigate the financial risk but without any risks we won't be able to see the full potential of anime. How many creators are limited by the reality that they're nothing more than freelancers with no stability or creative freedom. The best option for many of them is to become a movie animator where the rates are better than television anime but it's still under the same system. A system that extracts value from the work of animators with little regard for their well-being and livelihood. 
At the end of the day, the only thing that matters to stakeholders is their bottom line. At least with government support, an alternative funding model can be identified and funding of projects with higher budgets and creative freedoms would allow for a new pipeline to acquire talent and remunerate staff with better pay and work schedules. Whilst there are constraints, especially when dealing with government bureaucracy, the benefits and potential for creating work that's globally appealing and resonates with the Japanese audiences would provide more value than the costs associated with the production. Production. The truth is, the industry is plagued with issues and many people are afraid to speak out, lest they be made an example of or become blacklisted in the industry. Those at the top of the industry are often pure businessmen and they themselves don't know how to address these issues and view anime as nothing more than a product. Whilst speaking to someone involved in anime production, they have personally viewed the culture gap and generational gap as some of the more pressing issues. Business clients whose mentality resides in the 60s and 70s demanding anime be made for a small budget when you would need five times as much money to attempt to produce a high caliber work yet those pure businessmen and stakeholders at the top say it's been done before why can't it be done now to add to that it's culturally taboo to ask questions so those under the corporate sponsors have to make it work somehow when the reality is the lack of money leads to being unable to attract new talent and a lack of new talent leads to huge gaps in the schedule that can't be solved without overworking those involved. As a result, the quality of anime will decline. But as long as the corporate sponsor has a product, it doesn't matter what the quality of the output is like. This cultural and generational gap leads to staff getting abused and people who suffer silently enduring the harsh circumstances and eventually quitting the industry without being able to change anything. That's why it's such a big deal to see this production assistant speaking out and asking for help from a labor union which has put a lot of pressure on Madhouse and more importantly their owner NTV to address these issues. However, since these issues are not unique to just Madhouse, studios aren't a pleasant environment to work with and that goes for many of the big names as well. Marketing your studio to be an amazing environment has warped the perception of the actual environment and it's important to separate the works of a studio from the actual workplace. Even well-renowned studios like Toei who pay their employees above industry norm and has a union that fights for their workers' rights aren't immune to issues. Recently, a female animator severed ties with Toei over workplace harassment and sexism coming from a production manager who told her she didn't have the right mindset to be a director because women are emotional whilst also blatantly saying that she was being paid less due to her gender. It's honestly a shame that this backwards mentality has continued to exist and permeate but the reality is that there are 17 executives at Toei and none of them are women so it's safe to say that it's not a priority even if the executives say that it's something that they'd like to address in the future. Seeing very talented and capable people being bullied out of their workplace is not something to be proud of and it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. But this shows you how many different problems exist within the industry that both stem from cultural and generational elements. However, one of the most interesting stories that I read whilst researching for this video was pertaining to the Chinese company Bilibili who were desperately looking for animators and to incentivize talent to go work for them they were willing to pay in between his regular salaries of 250,000 yen or 2,200 a month. To give further contrast, the role of production assistant that Madhouse were overworking and underpaying their staff for, Billy Billy has a job listing where they offer 250k yen to 400k yen, with working hours being 10 to 7 pm, 5 days a week with a 1 hour break. Weekends off, paid holiday time, summer holiday, year end and new year holiday time, plus added opportunity for raises, transport expenses being paid and bonuses. There's a lot that can be said about Billy Billy's ambition. Certainly the size and desire to enter the animation industry is spurring on these competitive rates and hopefully there are some Japanese staff willing to actually take the jump and highlight that working in an environment that places equity in their workers can be something that leads to the industry being rehabilitated. The issue right now for Billy Billy is that they're looking for 3 to 4 directors, 30 animators for roles such as animation supervisors, episode directors, Genga and checkers, 5 production assistants so it'll be interesting to see if they can get the ball rolling as their past works were done through outsourcing alone. 
Given that they have a modest goal of creating three anime a year, it will be interesting to see where they are in a couple of years and whether or not they can get the studio off the ground and whether or not they can live up to their aspirations. Though this isn't the only company that's willing to pay competitive rates. Motoki Tanaka, also known as Tensho, started an animation studio named Saint Burberry in 2017 and has been working on maintaining a healthy work environment. Tensho offered beginner animators 180,000 to 300,000 and has been invested in fostering a working environment that allows staff to lead healthy lives. We'll be able to see the results of Burberry's efforts with their forthcoming Azur Lane anime, so I'll be keeping a close eye at how that turns out, but it's looking good so far. I do find it a bit funny that Burberry's first anime adaptation is a game published by Billy Billy, but that's just a sidebar. On the other hand, one of the most well-known, famous and renowned studios that managed to navigate the anime industry whilst fostering and nurturing young talent in-house is the famed Kyoto Animation. It wouldn't be far-fetched to say that they're the industry standard and what more animation studios should aspire to be like, and not in a lip service type of way that studio with George Wada has attempted to do so in the past to comical degree, but rather to have a dedication to building up and fostering young talent in an environment that caters to their needs. Kyoto Animation is a unique animation studio in the landscape of anime production. Their desire to establish a culture and aesthetic unique to them led KyoAni to establishing the Kyoto Animation School, where their staff could ingrain the fundamentals of their approach in the young talents who have gone to do amazing works for the studio. Likewise, they trust and reward their young talent with a chance to direct and handle episodes for shows and it's paid off for them. But their approach extends beyond just nurturing talent. The studio allows employees with children who aren't old enough to go to school to have shorter work days and for the employees on childcare leave they created a monthly magazine to keep up with the details of the production and the happenings at the studio so that they don't feel out of touch when they return. This is far and beyond what any other studio has done and it's these forward thinking initiatives that has given employees the chance to grow and have faith in the studio. When in-betweeners are being paid living wages and there's a continual focus on ensuring employees are unified in their work-life balance, it's not hard to see why the studio has reached such astronomical heights. Kyoto Animation has gone from being subcontracted to doing episodes for other studios to handling and financing productions of their own shows in the current day. For all the complaints about the production committee system, Kyoto Animation has managed to make the most of the system by vying for independence and complete creative control in what they adapt. At first they handled properties like Full Metal Panic Fumofu in 2003 and partnered with Karakawa to great success, with their titles Haruhi and Lucky Star becoming massive hits. As a result, they slowly climbed up the production communities contributing more financially to the shows that they were making, but that wasn't enough. Kyoto Animation's desire for full ownership and integration led them to announce the Kyoto Animation Awards, a program where staff would award novel submissions that they liked. This led them to beginning their own publishing imprint, K.A. Esuma, and the titles that won subsequently were adapted to anime. The result of this was the complete 360 ownership of the rights to the anime they made. By holding the copyrights of the titles they adapted, they were making a significant amount of money back on each production. Kyoto Animation leveraged the current system and made it work for them by having a dedication to firstly fostering young talent and ensuring a pipeline for their creatives, then subsequently funding their own productions and owning the copyrights to the titles they adapted so that they made more back from each production by diversifying their revenue streams. This approach has given them immense creative control and financial flexibility that could only work by ensuring the fundamentals of the studio and its culture were well established. This method is immensely risky and only a few players can manage to create an environment where they have complete 360 control but it's only by taking these risks that they've managed to continually evolve their brand and reap the reward of their investments. As for the rest of the industry, there's a dire situation at hand and one studio out of hundreds that exist has figured out a way to flourish but it's not possible for most studios under the current circumstances. Not every studio can become a publisher and, and own 100% of the copyrights so for the vast majority of studio they can only emulate some aspects and to their credit studios like PA Works are attempting to do so but the reality is that studios need to reevaluate the current system so they're able to pay living wages and for those financiers of anime 
anime that view production of anime as purely a business enterprise need to be reined in. The costs of production will continue to go up and there's a limit to how much anime can be outsourced before it all manages to collapse. There was 116,000 minutes of anime broadcast in 2017 according to the Association of Japanese Animators and they believe that might be the maximum limit for Japanese animation studios relying on traditional 2D animation methods. With more than 350 anime being broadcast a year, it's clear that overproduction is an issue and as anime continues to become more and more popular, especially overseas with the prominence of legal streaming having led to a desire for more original content, especially from players like like Netflix and Amazon with the former looking to invest heavily in anime. Yet Netflix has been touting itself as savior and a disruptive force to the issue of anime production committees when the truth is they have yet to make any direct efforts and as of yet solve the issue. Most of the Netflix original titles were titles they bought online distribution rights for from the production committees they were supposedly disrupting and it's only now in 2019 that Netflix are fully funding the Eden anime by Cubic Pictures based out of New York Tokyo without a production committee and even that's only 4 episodes. I'm curious to see how their direct deals with anime studios like Bones, Wit, IG and David Productions change things. If shows on their slate are funded directly without the use of production committees, it could mean that studios could rely on this alternative funding method to make money and pay their staff living wages, though that is up to the studios and their corporate owners at the end of the day. The Association of Japanese Animators makes an interesting point in the Anime Industry 2017 report that says that it's important for studios to avoid becoming content production factories in the streaming platform's quest for original content. That's really important as being beholden to one corporate sponsor over another without the care and health of the studios won't do animation studios any favors in the long term considering that in the past when anime committees made deals with Netflix USA they had to pay for all the dubbing and subtitling and production costs up front for the shows that they were going to release. That's why we got some rather lackluster dubs and subs for shows like Ico Incarnation which ended up being redubbed. However, it's not all bad news in this regard. One of the major reasons Bones and Production IG made the deal, according to Bones President Masahiko Minami and IG President Mitsuhisa Ishikawa, is that they want to reach overseas countries without the production committee system and they felt that they were big enough as a studio to do this. As a result, this alliance has huge benefits for the production studios as Ishikawa commented that it'd be possible to increase the unit price of key animation by 20 to 50%, which ultimately means higher wages for the animators involved in these projects. So the production studios will handle the production costs of their titles and Netflix will handle the distribution costs associated with being on the platform. However, I would be interested in knowing how much the royalty breakdown would be and if the staff associated with each project would receive royalties for their work on the production particularly those high up like directors and character designers. The industry knows that there needs to be a change and President Minami and Ishikawa are taking interesting steps to enact that change by ensuring adequate funding is sent to the staff and the relationship is directly beneficial to both parties by retaining value and equity. It's not a method that can work for everyone, particularly with those studios who have low profit margins, but I'm curious to see how things evolve in this space within the next few years. Streaming is undoubtedly becoming a bigger piece of the pie and with that there's new avenues for monetization of content for rights holders and some of those who I've spoken to believe that things are far beyond repair given the dire outlook so far. Regardless, I'm sure you'd agree with me that 350 anime a year is unsustainable and that there is an overproduction issue but there's so many factors at play that has been the norm for years within the industry that enacting any sort of change will take drastic measures. This was quite the intense topic to both research and my writing easily ballooned into double the length I expected it to be and I could easily write another 10 pages on this topic. But given how much ground there was to cover, I couldn't help but address these issues one by one and it grew lengthier and lengthier as the days went on and more reports came back from the industry. This video wouldn't have been possible without the sources I've listed in the description below so I highly recommend you check all of them out as well as the people I've had conversations with who've contributed to the production of anime in this industry. So I'd like to thank all of them and I'd like to thank all of you for watching thus far. Let me know your thoughts and comments and if you're interested in more content like this, check out my Patreon as it would greatly help my ability to make content like this. Until next time, take care folks.